But if you'd like to stand as we open our service in song. Father, we thank you for at Christmas time. We remember uh, that Emmanuel came, that God is with us, that he came to the stable, but Lord, that he didn't stay there, that he went to the cross. He went to the cross for me. He went to, to loose sinners from the claims of hell. Lord, we thank you um, that we can be free because of the Lord Jesus, and Lord, that we can look forward to the day that he returns. We can look forward to the day that the trumpet sounds as the sky is pulled back as the Lord Jesus returns in glory and power. Lord, we long for that day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope and without light Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, and praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise 
forever to the King of Kings. To reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side. Knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. Praise the Father, praise the Son, and praise the That stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old, it shall not deal and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name and in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ who has resurrected me. Praise the Father. Yes, Father, we come here to praise you this morning because you are a good God. You're a God who stepped into this broken world because he loved us. Lord, a God who is willing to give his life up for us so that we might be made right with you, so that we might spend eternity with you. Lord, just fill our hearts with praise, with worship, with adoration towards the good God that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Do take a seat. We're going to have our, our reading this morning. Morning. Um, the reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 2 and verses 1 to 21. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. 
she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on, whose he, on whom his favour rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about them, told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Well, we're going to sing again a couple of songs before uh, we come to hear from God's word. Um, so it's His mercy is more first.
encourage you yeah sorry Tom's just reminded me those that are here for Explorers Extra uh, young people if you want to go out uh, you've got your own uh, session now at the back <coughs> nearly forgot brilliant um, can I just encourage you all to come to that event next Saturday uh, even if you've not got kids uh, could you come? It would be really, really encouraging to the folk that have organised it and it would also help to create a bit of an atmosphere if there's a crowd and not just one sort of lonely family wandering around. So please, please come. Even if it's only for 15 minutes, half an hour, uh, that would be great and uh, it will create a bit more of a, of, a, of a buzz about the thing. And I think you will enjoy it actually. It is good fun. I, I know some of the things that are lined up. We've got some giant inflatables and some uh, a snowball competition and it's not real snowballs but anyway uh, all sorts going off so I, I, it will be good fun and um, if you can bring kids even better if you've got grandchildren or uh, somebody you know that you can bring uh, I think they, they'd enjoy it too and all the kids are going to get uh, free gifts uh, free goodies so they're all going to get a, a book um, what's it called Tom when Santa heard the gospel right yeah and Santa will actually give them the book what more could you ask for? So, um, yeah. Um, and then there's other goodies we're going to be moving out to. Um, so it's a really good opportunity in a very friendly and fun way to, uh, to get the real message of Christmas across. So as we come to God's word, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your holy word. And we pray now, Lord, as we look into it, as we, we study this wonderful and amazing truth, of the birth of your son, we pray that you might set our hearts on fire with a, a, a fresh love, a, a, a new awe, a new sense of wonder of all that you have done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, we, we thank you for these precious truths. Thank you that they are true, that it's not a myth, it's not a story. And we thank you, Lord, that it's not just a message that's locked in history but we thank you that it makes a difference to our lives today Lord Jesus you're alive 
you're in heaven, you're seated on the throne. And as we learn about your birth this morning, we pray that you would meet with us by your spirit, that you would come amongst us and that, Lord, we might sense your very near presence and hear your voice. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, every birth is special, isn't it? Um, it's the beginning of a new life. Uh, I've witnessed four births. Hands up here if you've witnessed a birth. Oh, not that many. Really? Hands up here if you've given birth. All oh, right, okay, yeah. Well, you've witnessed a birth, haven't you? <laughs> you were there at the time. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was there for all four of our kids being born. First two in hospital, second two at home. And I never really got used to the experience. It was just a bit too gory for me. I'm a bit squeamish. And uh, yeah, I, I'd long for the days when, you know, the olden days when the men used to wait outside and pace up and down and the midwife would come out and say, it's a boy, it's a girl. It never happened. I had to be right in there. And uh, I did my best. And as I often say, I got through it with the help of gas and air. Uh, but it was a traumatic experience. <laughs> no, it was great. And it is wonderful. It is a miracle, isn't it? Um, and I'm sure if you're a parent, if you witness that birth, it, you'll never forget it. It really is remarkable. And for you... That is the most special and most important birth of all, isn't it? But we've got to say that some births are more significant in terms of history than others. So on April the 20th, 1889, in a town in Austria, a little baby was born to Alios and Clara. And they named him Adolf. The birth of Adolf Hitler and how that impacted the 20th century. Mind you, 15 years earlier, on the 30th of November, 1874, another baby was born, and he was given the name Winston. <laughs> Winston Churchill. And of course, those two babies, as men, came head to head, and, well, the rest is history. But we're looking this morning at the birth of Jesus, and it is in an altogether different league, even to the birth of Hitler or Churchill or anybody else you want to mention, because this birth, this baby, changed all of history for all of time. That's how significant it is. So I've called this morning, The Saviour Has Come. As you know, we've been going through Luke's Gospel, we're going to continue into the new year, but we've come to Luke chapter 2, the passage that was read to us earlier on. And the birth of Jesus is announced by the angels. They say, good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Jesus has come. Of course, we know it's what Christmas is all about. Although, to watch your telly, or, you know, to be in society, you wouldn't guess that, would you? I think if an alien came down today and said, oh, what's all this all about? You know, the food, the festivities, the fun. They watch telly for a few hours. I'm not sure they'd be any the wiser, would they? Wouldn't have a clue that it's about the birth of Jesus. Sadly, the name of Jesus for most people will just be a swear word this Christmas time. And yet it really is all about Jesus. That's why we have Christmas. So let's look at the birth. If you've got a Bible, do turn to it. If you want to use one of the church Bibles, it's on page 1027, Luke chapter 2. So let's look again at those first seven verses. It says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. While there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Now, it seems to me that what Luke is emphasising in these first few verses of chapter 2 is the place that Jesus was born, the place where he was born. Remember, we said that Luke was a careful historian, and, and this passage bears it out. So he begins setting it in its historical context. He says it was in the days of Caesar Augustus. Of course, he was the Roman emperor. He ruled over the empire of Rome from 31 BC to 14 AD. And then he talks about Quirinius, the governor. 
Now look, this may be completely over your heads and you may not be even interested in this, but it is just worth noting that there have been historians that have questioned this bit of Luke. The whole business about Quirinius uh, and the census being taken. Some historians have actually suggested that Luke got it wrong here. Uh, because we know from other historical records, there was a census in 6 AD. Again, under the governor Quirinius. And some people have said, oh, well, there you are, you see. <laughs> the Gospels are inaccurate. Luke didn't get it right. However, historical evidence now shows us that Quirinius was governor for two separate periods. He was governor between 3 and 2 BC and then later in 6 AD. And there was a census at both times. The first one was a census to register everyone so that the emperor would know exactly what taxes he was going to get. And then in 6 AD, those taxes were collected. And that caused a huge controversy, um, particularly in Israel. In fact, Luke himself talks about that second census in 6 AD. You can read about that in Acts. See, Luke was right all along. And uh, it, it, funny, isn't it, how, how we find it so easy to question the Bible. <laughs> People do. And yet time and time again, history has proved the Bible is accurate. It really can be trusted. Uh, and as we saw earlier on in the introduction, that was Luke's aim here. He wants to give a very accurate account of what's going on. And so all of this really happened in history. This isn't a story that we just tell once a year, you know. It's not just something so that schools have a play to put on, <laughs> you know, a nativity with Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the, all the rest of it. No, this is real history we're looking at here. It really happened. But as I say, Luke wants us to see how important it is where it happened. And so I want to say three things about that. First of all, it was the right place at the right time. We read there in verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David. Now why is that so important? Well it's important because in the Old Testament there are many prophecies about the coming Messiah. One of them you'll read in the book of Micah. This is it. It was actually written 500 years before Jesus was born. And this prophecy about the coming Messiah says this, but you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you're small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Now remember, Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth. Nazareth is 80 miles north, up in the area of Galilee. And in those days, that was quite a journey, 80 miles. Of course, no cars, no taxis, no planes. You had to walk. That was a, a good three-day journey. Uh, I know we often have pictures of Mary on a donkey. She may have been on a donkey, we don't know. But it was still a long, long journey, and it would have taken three days. Now, they lived in Nazareth, the most normal, natural place for Mary to have her baby, was in Nazareth. She was about nine months. So I don't think, you know, she would be particularly keen on a three-day journey. Uh, ladies, when you were about to deliver, fancy going for three days on the back of a donkey? Well, it might get you into labour, but uh, it, it wouldn't be that desirable, would it? So, you know, they're going to stay in Nazareth, aren't they? That's the most logical thing that's going to happen. It's got to happen, right? No, it doesn't happen. Why? Because hundreds of miles away, in Rome, in Italy, Caesar decides he wants to have a census. And so he sends out this order that everyone was to return to the place of their ancestors. And guess where Joseph's ancestors came from? Bethlehem. So, I'm sure unwillingly, reluctantly, but of necessity, they have to make the journey. And so they do. They come from the north right down to the south. Never good to leave the north, is it? But anyway, they had to go down south. And, uh, and so they arrive there at, at Bethlehem. And 
were told there that it was at that very moment when Mary goes into labour. Do you know, isn't it wonderful? God's plans are never frustrated by our circumstances. Proverbs 21 one says this, The king's heart is in the hands of the Lord. Like the rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes. God's on the throne, not the emperor, not the president of the United States of America, not Boris, not Putin, not anyone. God's on the throne and, and he orders even the affairs of kings and rulers to bring about his purposes and plans. That is so encouraging to hear, isn't it? Because the world can sometimes look like a runaway train, you know, about to derail and it can all seem utterly hopeless and disastrous. Well, men are evil and there is a lot of chaos in the world, but ultimately, ultimately God reigns and rules over it all. And he will bring about his purposes for this world. Of course, ultimately, that's the return of Jesus. So in just the right place at just the right time, just as the prophets had predicted. And then secondly, I want to say this. It was the only place, just in time. So we read there, she wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Bethlehem was busy, understandably. Everybody whose ancestors came from there had had to make a beeline for Bethlehem, and now all the B&Bs were booked up, you know. Was, uh, no vacancies in every window. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. Um, it happened to us on our honeymoon. Can you believe this? We travelled all the way up to Scotland. We got a lovely log cabin booked. And when we arrived and knocked on the door, another couple were there. And they were there for the week. And suddenly, you know, you thought, oh wow, what are we going to do? Anyway, we rang the guy and who we booked it through. He said, oh, I know, I'm sorry, there's been a mix-up. Uh, you can't stay there anymore. And he found us this other really grotty place. It was a half made, built place. It was covered in dust. We turned the fire on it, blew up. Uh, there was no cut. Well, there was cutlery, but it all had the, the price tags on it still because the guy had obviously rushed out and bought a load of stuff. Anyway, that was our first week of honeymoon. Um, wonderful. Our first few nights, anyway. Now, at least we had a roof over our heads. I mean, Mary and Joseph didn't, did they? There was no room. And so they ended up out back with the animals. The only place. And just in time. Because as they landed, Mary went into labour. And that's where Jesus was born. The only place. No room. Hey, doesn't that sound familiar? No room for Jesus at Christmas? It does, doesn't it? No room for Jesus at Christmas in Britain in the 21st century. We're far too busy. You know, we're, we're far too occupied. We've got family coming. You know, I, I'm afraid we just can't think about that religious stuff. And so we push Christ out. And maybe, well, is it reading too much into the narrative to suggest that this might actually be a picture of the way the world treats Jesus? I'm not so sure. And then I want to say, thirdly, it was the lowest place at any time. It says she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. Uh, last night I uh, went to hear Handel's Messiah. Fiora and I went. Um, it was amazing. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard the Messiah live. Wow, it's breathtaking. There was a choir of 150, a big orchestra. And uh, it, it's just wonderful. And as a Christian, it's especially wonderful. Because all of the words are taken straight from Scripture. And, and they're all about Jesus. I mean, I sat there looking around, and I don't know how many hundred were there, but thinking, do people really get this? What is being sung about here? I love that one, for unto us a child is born. It's just glorious, isn't it, if you know that one? Well, it was a real blessing to be there. And the location was stunning. We were actually in Ripon Cathedral. So imagine that. Massive pillars, this huge vaulted ceiling, stained glass windows, 
It was an amazing place to be in. And there you had the soloists all in their evening suits and white dicky bow ties. And uh, it was quite posh, I have to say. I felt a bit out of place. The lady in front of me had a, a, a fur coat on. I think uh, we were in elevated company, some of them anyway. Um, but uh, it, it was very impressive, very impressive. But in the interval, I needed the loo. And there was no toilet in the cathedral. So I had to bomb out of the cathedral. And this guy said, oh, you have to cross the street and there's some public toilets over there. So yeah, I ran across to the public loos. And you know what these places are like, don't you? They're sort of cold and damp and a little bit smelly. But anyway, I won't go into details. But anyway, I used the loo um, and I went back. But you know, I thought, actually, it would have been far more appropriate if we'd all gathered round the public toilets and sung for unto us a child is born would have been more accurate wouldn't it not some grand cathedral but just a smelly stinking backyard probably made those public toilets look quite hygienic wow the lowest place it was a bad place to spend any night, but I think perhaps the worst place to give birth. We've got to get rid of those nice, lovely, cosy stable scenes that you get in Christmas cards that are all disinfected and lovely. Um, doesn't actually say there was even a stable. Doesn't even say there was a stable. Just says there was a manger. Could have been in the open air. But whatever, it would have been uncomfortable and unhygienic. And yet into that place, the very Son of God is born. What a stoop. And remember, this is where God chose to enter this world. See, we can look at this and just think, well, Mary and Joseph were overtaken by circumstances, weren't they? Forced to go to Bethlehem, no room because it was so busy, and they just had to be there, you know, that no... But remember, who's on the throne of the universe? God. Who planned this? God. Who knew exactly what was going to happen? God. In other words, this was a place God chose to enter this world. That's even more remarkable, isn't it? He came to be with the least and the lowest, not born in a palace. And if he had been born in a palace, do you think shepherds could have got in? you think ordinary people could have related to him? They might have been tempted to say, oh no, he's, he's for the, the hoi pie, you know. That, that's where he's from. And so he got as low as you possibly could so that nobody in the whole world could say, I can't reach that. I can't relate to that. Nobody can say that, can they? The homeless refugee that is fleeing Syria or Iraq. And I suspect some of them will be giving birth in the open air. They know that God relates to them, don't they? Because he's been there. He's been there. The lowest place at any time. And then I want us to think about the second part of this section and uh, this is all about the witnesses this is the emphasis of 8 to 20 the witnesses so let's look at it oh we've already got it uh, verse 8 and there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby keeping watch over their flocks at night an angel of the lord appeared to them and the glory of the lord shone around them and they were terrified but the angel said to them do not be afraid i bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Now remember what we've said, we've said it a number of times, Luke is concerned to give us accurate accounts here and he repeatedly refers to the eyewitnesses, those were, that were there at the time that actually witnessed what was going on and so we have here the first eyewitnesses, apart from obviously Mary and Joseph, to the coming of Jesus and I want to suggest first of all they were unlikely witnesses, they were unlikely witnesses. Our idea of shepherds today is very different to first century Israel. We have a kind of romantic idea of the shepherd, don't we? 
I always think of one man and his dog. Do you remember that? Um, sort of herding sheep with his, his flat cap and uh, whatever. And, and we think of shepherds being sort of a, a nice cuddly bunch, a sort of admiral, ad, admirable um, occupation. Well, in Jesus' day, it was very different. Uh, perhaps you're aware of this. They were regarded as the lowest of the low in first century Israel. Religious leaders maligned shepherds. Rabbis banned pasturing sheep and goats, except in desert plains. The Mishnah, which is Judaism's written record of the oral law, also reflects this kind of prejudice, referring to shepherds in belittling terms. One passage describes them as incompetent. Another says, get this, no one should ever feel obliged to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. <laughs> Can you imagine that? That was how they were viewed. Jeremiah's document says that uh, shepherds were deprived of all civil rights. They could not fulfill judicial offices and they were not admitted into a court of law to be witnesses. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? The first witnesses of the birth of Jesus were the ones that everybody else dismissed. Jeremiah went on to write this, to buy wool, milk or kid from a shepherd was forbidden on the assumption that it would be stolen property. Shepherds were officially labelled sinners, which was a technical term for people who were despised. And it was into this group of people, suffering from all this religious snobbery and class prejudice, that God stepped into this world. How significant that God picked this group of people to hear the joyful news of the birth of Jesus. And again, what are we being reminded of? We're being reminded of that God came right down to our level and he came for everyone. He came for everyone. People at the top of the social ladder and people right on the bottom rung. He's the saviour for all people, the angels said. For all people. How that would have spoken to those shepherds. For all people? What, for us? You know, the unwanted? Uncared about? He's come for us. Here, in a sense, we should all have that attitude, shouldn't we? We should all have that. We should all be saying, he's come for me. Really? He loved me? He came to save me? I am so unworthy. That should be our attitude, shouldn't it? No, God doesn't have favourites like we do. He's not elitist or prejudiced like we often are. This is hope for the hopeless. It's good news for all, for all people. And then we've got the heavenly witnesses in this section. The angels. So verse 9, it says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a saviour has been born. He's the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find the baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly with a gr there was a great company of the heavenly hosts who appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. On earth peace to those on whom his favour rests the angels witnessed to the birth of Jesus didn't they uh, get this familiar refrain don't be afraid we've heard it so many times haven't we don't be afraid listen this message is is the very opposite of fear don't be afraid it's actually a message of great joy it's the coming of a saviour the saviour of the world remember we said that's the great theme of Luke He's the saviour of the world. And he's the Messiah. That is God's anointed, promised king. The fulfilment of those messianic prophecies. He's the Messiah, said the angels. He's the Lord. He is God. And that is why he can save us. Only God could save us. Only Jesus could save us. And incidentally, that's why he's born as a man. We've said it already. Only 
A man of flesh and blood can die for people of flesh and blood. And so he is the saviour because he is God and he is man. He's the saviour of the world. And then the angels say to the, the shepherds, you'll find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. I think that must have really shook those shepherds, mustn't it? Lying in a manger? I mean, that's where we feed our sheep. Really? The Messiah, the Lord, the saviour of the world? Not in some grand house in Bethlehem where we keep our animals? Yes. It's exactly where you'll find him. I suppose it meant one thing. They weren't going to find the wrong baby, were they? <laughs> they were not going to get mixed up with some other baby born in Bethlehem. There'd be no doubt which one it was. The one lying in a manger. You know, there weren't too many babies lying in a manger. I'm sure there was only one that night. It was Jesus. That's where you'll find him. Well, how it must have amazed them. But here's the point, isn't it? We've said it already. It is through humiliation and rejection that Jesus is going to save the world. We talked about this last week, but so many got it wrong, didn't they? They thought it was through power and influence and military might that Jesus was going to save the world. What's Luke telling us? What's he reminding us here? He's saying, look, he was born in humiliation and rejection no room for him just with the animals rejected but that is going to be the mark of his whole mission that is how he's going to save the world and that humiliation and rejection is going to end at a cross stripped naked nailed high drowning in his own blood the humiliation the shame of crucifixion the rejection of the world. Because that's the kind of saviour he's come to be. That's what Luke is saying. That is the saviour he's come to be. The one who'll be rejected and humiliated and humbled. But it's wonderful because ultimately that is going to result in our salvation. Finally, I want to say this. They were enthusiastic witnesses. Look at verse 15. It says, when the angels had <coughs> left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. As soon as the shepherds get the message from the angels, what do they do? It says immediately, they rush off to Bethlehem. They say, let's go now. What happened to the sheep? We don't know. But quite frankly, at that moment in time, it didn't matter. Let's just get down to Bethlehem and find out if this really is true. What a great example to us. Enthusiastic seeking of the Lord at Christmas time. Is that our response? So many people in the world have said, no time for Jesus. But as we hear this message, do we say in our hearts, I want to seek this saviour. I want to know him. That should be our attitude, shouldn't it? And then when they leave the manger, what does it say? Verse 17, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. I don't know how this worked. I have no idea how long they were at the, at the, at the, the manger. <laughs> Maybe they spent several hours there and it was morning. I kind of wonder if it was still the early hours. And I have this picture of them going round Bethlehem, knocking up the friends and neighbours and saying, hey, I've got some news. And people bleary-eyed coming to the door and saying, do you know what time it is? Well, they wouldn't look at the wristwatch. Do you know what time it is? Um, you know, and them saying, no, no, you've got to listen. It's so important. The Messiah has come. The Lord has come. The Saviour has come. We've been told it by the angels. We've seen it with our own eyes. And I'm sure that they were just beaming from ear to ear. Beaming from ear to ear. You know, when I was converted, I was 15 when I was saved. I was on a youth camp. And uh, one of the leaders had witnessed to me. And uh, I went back to my bed that night, couldn't sleep. At 2 o'clock in the morning, 
I prayed a prayer and I simply asked the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive me, come into my life and change me. I knew I needed forgiving. I knew I didn't know God, but I wanted to. And I prayed that prayer and deep down in my heart there was a real peace. Next morning, I met one of the leaders. Do you know what she said to me? She said, you've become a Christian, haven't you? I said, how do you know? It, it was two o'clock in the morning last night. How do you know? I haven't told anyone. She said, it's written all over your face. <laughs> written all over your face. It's true, you know. When you meet the Saviour, wow, there is a joy, isn't there? should be. should put a smile on your face. It's the best news you'll ever hear. And it was for these shepherds. And it says, they, were, they went away rejoicing. Rejoicing. Praising God. I wonder if we're going to do that this Christmas. We should be. Rejoicing like they were. Praising God and spreading the word. Are we going to be enthusiastic witnesses? Or are we just going to keep it to ourselves in our little holy huddle in church? Shouldn't be, should be. We should be telling everyone. So full of it that we can't keep it to ourselves. That's what these shepherds were like. Did you notice what it says there in verse 19? This is an interesting verse. It says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Do I wonder if the visit of the shepherds was as much for Mary and Joseph as it was for the shepherds? I wonder if they weren't thinking, boy, we've really made a mess of this. We were chosen to bring the Son of God into the world. We didn't even find somewhere to spend the night and look, he's been born where the animals are in a manger. I don't know, I'm guessing. But I, I, I wonder if she might have felt that. What a letdown. All seems so chaotic and confused. And I wonder if this wasn't just Mary thinking, right, this was the right place, the right time. So the shepherds could hear the message and come and visit the child. Well, it's certainly true, wasn't it? Certainly true. God was in control of the whole situation for Mary, for Joseph, for the shepherds, and of course, most of all, for Jesus himself, the fulfillment of all these prophecies. Listen, as I close, can I just ask, what will be your response to Christmas? I wonder if it really will be the response of the shepherds, that we really will put Christ at the very centre of our Christmas, and that the deepest joy that we have, beyond family, beyond presence, the deepest joy that we have will be in the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust that will be true. Should be, shouldn't it? May it be true of each one of us. In Jesus' name, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful, glorious passage of scripture that just tells us of your amazing birth. And Lord, we want to praise you we want to praise you like the shepherds did. We want to glorify God just at this amazing fact that you left heaven and came to the very lowest place. You humbled yourself. You were willing to be humiliated and even rejected. And Lord, thank you that you carried that humiliation and rejection all the way to Calvary, to the cross, to be our saviour. Lord, thank you that there's an answer to guilt, that our sin can be cleansed, taken away forever. As we've sung earlier on, your mercy is more, more than all of our sin, because Jesus carried that sin and died to save us from it. And Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you've come to live within our hearts for all of us that have said, Lord, there's room in my life for you. I want you to be my saviour, my Lord, come and live within me by your spirit. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've taken up residence in our hearts, in our lives today. Oh, we pray. We pray for this community. So many people who are utterly ignorant of these things. Maybe others who've rejected them. But oh God, we pray that the Lord Jesus might find entrance into many hearts and lives in Tingley this Christmas time. Bring them here, Lord, to hear your word. We pray next week we'd have a full building 
and that people would hear for the very first time this joyous news. Lord, use us to be witnesses to you in our, amongst our family, our friends, our work colleagues. May we be joyful, enthusiastic witnesses of all that we have heard and experienced. Help us to be that, Lord. Give us the boldness, uh, the courage to do that. And so, Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing a final song. Thank you. To the skies, there's a celebration. Lift up your heads, join the angel song. For our Creator becomes our Savior as a baby born. Angels amazed, bowing adoration. Glory to God in the God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Amen.